Welcome to the Fantasy Football Sackos Podcast with your hosts, Jason Shellcross and Alex Krogh. Let's go! Alex, there we go! Welcome, Alex and Jason, back for the Sackos. Let's go. Uh, we have our, what, week six preview show ahead of us. Alex, guess what, buddy? I have... 99 subs and a bitch ain't one. How does that grab you? 99 subs. Um, that honestly, um, I just hate everything about fantasy football right now. I can't believe I have to do a fantasy football podcast with you, and I just hate everything about fantasy football. But we have 99 and, YouTube and subscribers that love come- us. No, that's great. No, thank you so much. But Everything about fantasy football for me this year has sucked. I've lost by 1.1 and 1.36 in our league. I scored the second most points one week. There's only three teams that have scored more points than me in five weeks. And I lost that week in a different league. I have the most points. I'm two and three. I've lost by 0.12 and like 1.1 again. And Johnu Smith just pissed me off. Last night, we're filming this uh, Wednesday, uh, dropping on Thursday. Ryan Fitzpatrick, or Fitzpatrick, Tana Thrill was like two feet in front of the... Oh, just everything makes me mad. Um, I literally got in my car this morning because I was still mad and just yelled as loud as I could on the way to work to feel better. Wow. And now I'm getting ripped apart on online for me talking about Chase Claypool um and uh yeah i the the only thing i can say about our podcast is that while nfl players might be getting duis and doing the deweys i can guarantee you that we're not podcasting under the influence and that means we're just not doing (laughs) pooies i might be setting my lineup under the influence i swear man oh man i well I lost because I went up against Jason Sanders and his lovely 22 point kicking output um, because the person I was playing against decided it would be a good idea to start the Miami Dolphins kicker. So that happened to me and I lost because of it. Um, Oh, well. Um, Yeah. Anyways, let's get into this week six preview. Thank you to all 99 of our YouTube subscribers. Thank you to anybody that subscribes to us on any listening platform. Go ahead, hit the like, subscribe button, ring the bell if you're watching on YouTube. Let's dive in. Um, We're going to switch it up a little bit this week. We aren't going to go through game by game by game. We want to talk about guys that Alex and I disagree on and uh, who we're higher on and who we're lower on this week. And we want to tell you why. Were you going to say something, Alex? Maybe I can finally be right about something for the first time all year. I, we're going through like 10 or 12 players or however many we go through. I will at least be right once. So I have that going for me. I think we need a. I'm hoping for a board bet somewhere in here because I think you're like over six on them so far. And so I'm looking forward to making you go over seven. Also, something Wait, you mean I, Fournette's not going to be a top 12 back this year. Exactly. We need to come up with a punishment too. Hey, in the comments down below, let us know whoever loses the most board bets, what their punishment should be at the end of the season. I think that there should potentially be some sort of haircut involved. That's just my personal opinion. And then we'll record it and post that as well. But all right, let's get into this. Uh, Let's start with quarterbacks. Uh, first up, we have Josh Allen going up against the Kansas City Chiefs this week. I have him as my number one overall quarterback because, yes, I do. And you have him down at six. Uh, number one? Yes. Get out of here with that. What are you talking about? All right. Make, make, the, it, make, make the case. Make the case. Number one overall this week. That, yeah, there's no chance. There's just no chance. Well, you're right. I mean, Russell Wilson is on a bye, so Russ would be number one, but he's on a bye. Dak's gone for the year, so Dak's gone. And 
Pat Mahomes has to play against the Bills defense. So I downgraded him just a touch. Who just got destroyed by Ryan Tannethrill. No, he didn't get destroyed by Ryan Tannethrill. He got destroyed by their defense, unfortunately for him. Uh, first time he's looked vulnerable all no, no, season. No, I'm saying... I, I'm saying the Bills defense got destroyed by Ryan Tannethrill, and now they're going to get destroyed by Patrick Mahomes, who I have number one overall this week, which is correct, and Josh Allen will not outperform just the other quarterback across the field from him this week. It's unbelievable. Uh, uh, so is that, you, is that you putting Ryan Tannehill in the same sentence as Patrick Mahomes? Is that what I'm getting? Is this the same Ryan Tannehill who you said uh, would be like, what, quarterback 20 on the season or something like that? What was our board bet again for Tannehill? Was it fifteen plus? Um, yeah. uh, who? No, it's it's who we ended up with. Who has more fantasy quarterback points, Minshew or Tannehill? Oh, okay. Well, that's a uh, that's going to be Tannehill, no brainer. But uh, as because you mentioned Tannehill in the same breath as Patrick Mahomes, I want to read you these stats and why Patrick Mahomes is the next Ryan Tannehill. In Tannehill's last 14 starts with Tennessee and Mahomes' last 14 starts with Kansas City, they both have a record of 11-3. and three. They've both thrown just over 3,600 yards. Uh, who do you think has more passing touchdowns in their last 14 starts, Mahomes or Tannehill? Mahomes. Nope. Sorry. Ryan Tannehill has three more passing touchdowns than Patrick Mahomes. They've each thrown six interceptions. Tannehill, however, has 31 passing touchdowns to six picks. And Mahomes has 28 passing touchdowns to six picks. Who do you think has a higher quarterback rating? I feel like it gives it away. Mahomes. Oh, no, you'd be care. wrong again I'm there. Gonna, I'm just going to feed in. I'm going to feed into you. Ryan Tannehill has a quarterback rating of 116.7 over his last 14 starts. Patrick Mahomes has a lowly rating of 102.3. So Pat Mahomes, Patrick rather, sorry, Mama Mahomes, is going to be the next Ryan Tannehill. He would be lucky if he should ever get to that Ryan Tannehill level. So just so we're clear on that. <clears throat> but why I'm doing a fantasy I want to talk about football podcast with an idiot bringing this back back to Josh Allen and the uh, the question that be uh, Josh Allen his career has really been a tale of two halves during his first 16 games he threw 13 touchdowns and 18 picks in his second 16 career games He's thrown 29 touchdowns to just four interceptions. He has been absolutely on fire to start the season. He's doing it both on the ground and through the air. He is their goal line running back, their red zone running back. Uh, Kansas City, yes, they're eighth against quarterbacks, but I mean, I don't think that they've played quite the dual threat like Josh Allen, other than maybe Lamar, but that was a fiasco. So. That the Ravens offense hasn't looked good at all this entire year. Uh, I think Josh Allen has a really good chance to finish as the number one quarterback this week. You're high on him too, having him all the way down at six. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he'll be fine. I just think one's too high. And, and plus, I don't think the Chiefs defense is terrible. And we talked about it before the season. We thought the Bills were going to start out really hot. They have. And then uh, Josh Allen did not look good against the Titans defense this past week. He threw two terrible interceptions. And uh, I would expect, you know, them to be behind to Kansas City. Uh, so why not? I, they are in Buffalo. So I, I don't know if that even makes a difference. I don't know if there's fans there or not. But uh, yeah, I would much rather have Mahomes over over Allen this week. But yeah, small details. <laughs> if you have the other one, you're starting them probably. All right, let's get into Deshaun Watson, uh, our next quarterback up here for a debate. 
I have him up at quarterback four this week. You have him all the way down at quarterback 18. I feel like that is a much worse rating as far as low than I am high. Sorry, I didn't mean to take out the mic. Uh, Please defend why you think Deshaun Watson will finish outside of the top 12. Not even that, but as quarterback 18 this week against the Titans. This again goes back more to having faith in the Titans defense than it does discounting Deshaun. Um, Again, the Titans defense looked really good against Josh Allen. So I'm expecting them to continue to look good. I think Derrick Henry and Mr. Tana Thrill are going to, you know, have control of the offense, uh, you know, keep the ball and keep Deshaun off the field. Uh, Deshaun first game with a with a new head coach put up his highest points for the year uh, last week. Um, so that is encouraging, but they were also facing Jacksonville. I. Uh, I. Who's who is he going to throw the ball to? Is it going to be Cooks? Is it going to be Will Fuller? Both will be fine. This is honestly just more of a gut call where I think an interdivision matchup where they both know each other very well. They play each other twice a year. They know the ins and outs. They know each other's tendencies. When it's a division game like this, I just always feel like it's lower scoring just because the teams know each other so well. So that's why I'm a little obviously lower on Watson than you. Uh, I have him ranked 18. You have him ranked up at four. Um, yeah, it's just it's just more of a uh, more more of a gut call and. I have faith in the in the Titans defense after having a, a long layoff. I know they have somewhat of a short turnaround, uh, but it's in Tennessee. They don't have to travel anywhere. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just this is more of a Titans faith uh, in their defense than it is a knock against Deshaun. OK, um, well, in Deshaun's first week without former head coach Bill O'Brien there and Romeo Coronel running the show. He finished as quarterback six last week uh, with just a shave under 25 uh, passing, passing, excuse me, a shave under 25 fantasy points. Uh, He did have more than 350 passing yards as well as three passing scores. Uh, Did throw two picks. Hate to see it, but a couple of rushes for more than 20 yards. He always, you know, chips in a couple yards here and there every week. But I think the big thing that's worth talking about is how that offense changed. They set season highs in play action rate with more than 29% last week and air yards per attempt. So the passes are being finally pushed further down the field. Um, The play action rate was 29% and the air yards per attempt mark was 11.1 under Bill O'Brien. He was on, they were only running play action 16% of the time, which was third lowest in the league. So different offensive philosophy, establish the run, run the play action pass, push the ball down the field, make those plays, hit Brandon Cooks, make him score some, some points, even though he's on Alex's bench because Alex doesn't know who to start when to start. <laughs> and uh, yeah, That's true. Tennessee is a middle of the pack team against cute quarterbacks so far in, in terms of fantasy output at 13th overall. So not a top 10 defense against QBs upper half. But uh, I think that uh, I think that we're seeing what that offense could look like. And I think we're seeing a little bit of progress under Cornell. So I have him up at four. I think that they will obviously uh, put the ball in the end zone a couple times. And so I look for Deshaun to uh, try to keep up with good old Ryan Tannethrill, who, by the way, one last little nugget was quarterback one last week with more than 30 points in fantasy. So the only quarterback to go over 30 last week. Yeah, he was throwing to Johnny Smith. I know. So our next quarterback up for debate is Kirk Cousins. Uh, Kirk Kirk Cousins and the Minneapolis or Minnesota Vikings are going up against the Atlanta Falcons. I have him ranked down at 13 this week, which is streamable option. Alex has him up at all the way up. At quarterback six, Alex, why are you so high on Kirk Cousins this week? Uh, Atlanta defense 
Do I need to say more? I mean, you, you, you talked about it on our last pod of being the stream of the week. He's currently quarterback 25. Uh, we both have Adam Thielen as our number one wide receiver this week. We both have Justin Jefferson uh, up, I believe, in the in the late teens from a flex perspective. Yeah. Um, he uh, if if they're both going to be top 20 wide receivers this week, then how can Kirk Cousins not be a top five quarterback like that? To me, that's just kind of if if X and Y, then Z. So if they're both going to be that good, then Kirk Cousins has to be that good. And we saw what Teddy Bridgewater did against them, basically 300 yards all in the first half. Uh, they kind of slowed it down in the second half. But the the way to clearly beat them is through the air. And if, it, you know, Mike Zimmer's being a little coy on Will, uh, you know, Will Cook's play or not, I don't think he's going to play. They got a bye week. Um, you might as well rest him uh, for the for the bye. Give him two weeks to get that groin fully healed. Nobody likes a groin injury. Not that I've ever had one. I just assume it has to suck. Uh, and <laughs> like really terribly, I, it has to be bad. So you got to get that thing healed up. Otherwise, you know, you there's more to life than just football. So I uh, I, I do think that they, they run the ball with, with Madison. Um, and uh, yeah, Kirk Cousins, if their wide receivers have to be good, then he has to be good. That's why I have him uh, ranked up at six. I'm just happy because that is the first time you've said Alexander Madison without having to sing the freaking song about Alexander Madison. Uh, you still haven't watched Hamilton. No, no, I haven't. Sorry. Sorry to everybody. That's a huge Hamilton fan. I'm sure I will one day. I just have not yet. Uh, yeah, I mean, you I, pretty much you nailed need to, it. You need to come over and watch Hamilton with me. Only if we hold hands while we watch it. Uh it, <laughs> Atlanta, as you said, giving up the most points to quarterbacks, uh, 30 fantasy points per game currently. I'm high on him, not to say that I'm not. I feel like I gave him a huge boost in his ranking based on uh, the matchup with Atlanta. Um, I would never rank him as quarterback 13 were he not playing them. Um, yeah, he's only... He's only gone over 20 points once this season. I'm just a little bit leery. So he's, a, I think, a great stream plug and play. But if I'm really desperate for streamers, I would probably try to pick up uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick before I tried to pick up Kirk Cousins. Um, next quarterback, Cam Newton. Uh, Newton and the Patriots uh, go up against Denver this week. I have him down at quarterback 12. Alex has him at quarterback three alex why are you high on cam this week all right so cam newton denver's terrible they're absolutely awful uh who who have they i mean sam darnold destroyed them a couple weeks ago with with jameson crowder cam newton is covid covid cam fully immune or whatever he is now fully he's immune? just gonna yeah, I don't know. The president says it. It's got to be true. The f the fact that <laughs> it it I guess it, this kind of depends on on what kind of league you're in, right? Because if if it's a pat, you know, four points for a passing touchdown, then Cam again. I still think he's the goal line back. Denver is giving up uh, the twenty sixth most, or like they're the twenty sixth worst team to giving up points to quarterbacks. I mean, Bill Belichick is just going to be like, hey, Cam, you haven't gotten hit in like three weeks. Here, just go run the ball a whole bunch. And I'm pretty sure he's going to. The first week, he had 15 carries. Second week, 11 carries. Third week against Las Vegas, he had nine carries. If he's going to get 10 carries a week and still throw for 200 yards uh, with a couple of bye weeks this week, I have Cam up at three. Denver's terrible. I expect them to roll over Denver. So, uh, yeah, give me give me all the Cam that all the Cam stock that uh, I can possibly buy. The only thing that I think is COVID is a respiratory affliction, respiratory viral virus. And so I'm just not, I'm not sure if you sit out of football for two weeks, you aren't really involved as much in the game planning I just think that they are going to try to lighten his load and maybe ease him in a little bit. 
And so I actually wouldn't be surprised if he turned around and handed the ball off to Damian Harris a little bit more than he ever would. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I'm semi interested to see if he actually starts because what's the rush to bring him back? It's not like they're hurting for W's. Um, I, yeah, they I, wouldn't I, play him if he wasn't at full speed, right? They, they just wouldn't. I mean, people play Boyer hurt all the terrible. time. It's just, this yeah, isn't he's like not really, hurt. He's not technically hurt. Yeah, it's know. a different type of hurt, right? The The Broncos uh, have given up two plus touchdowns in every game, except when they played the Jets. Um, so, I guess it's my uh, question is like, how asymptomatic was he? Did he have any symptoms? Was he really sick at all? Was it just waiting to get two negative yeah, tests and then he's back, right? I mean, those are things I don't think we'll ever really know, but I just think that maybe they don't make him strain a whole lot and maybe he throws a passing touchdown or gets in on a sneak or something, but I do have him down at quarterback 12, so he obviously is starting. He's going to start for you if you have him. I just think that maybe you shouldn't expect full-blown cam in this one. Maybe next time. So. Yeah. I, I, I just think he's back. He's playing. Belichick wouldn't play him if he wasn't fully up to speed. And plus, when a lineman are, are not going to take it easy on you, so you have to go full speed and be yourself, especially once you're back in that situation. So there, you're, you can't like hold Cam back. You know, he's either going to be Cam or he's going to not like. Th- th- he's going to be fine. So I am at three, especially with bye weeks this week. Uh, pe- people have been waiting for him to come back. They've been playing the the Fitzpatrick's of the world and the Teddy Bridgewater's of the world and the Goffs of the world uh, the last couple of weeks. And so it'll be it'll be nice to have your boy back. You're my boy, Blue. All righty, let's move on to running backs. Uh, Jonathan Taylor up against Cincinnati. I have him all the way up at running back four this week. I am bullish on Jonathan Taylor. Alex, you have him down at 19. Cincinnati is a whopping 18th against the run. Um, however, one thing I think Jonathan Taylor, this is an interesting stat. Jonathan Taylor is facing a stacked box with eight plus defenders on 27% of his runs which is fifth most in the league so far this season. Last season, in the same offense, Marlon Mack saw a stacked box on just over 12% of carries, which was 39th in the league. Complete, (laughs) complete shift in terms of how defenses are going after this Indianapolis Colts offense. They know that Jonathan Taylor is the only threatening part of it. Um, Honestly, it's a uh, they're playing at home against Cincinnati. I don't think Cincinnati's a good defense, and I think Jonathan Taylor falls into the end zone at least once, if not twice. I have him up at four. Uh, I just think that they're going to be successful against Cincinnati this week. So, um, yeah. Why do you yeah, have him down I, at I get that, and I. I totally understand where you're coming from. That, that's interesting with the stack boxes. So does that mean that defenses respect Jacoby Brissett more than they did Philip Rivers? Wouldn't kind, you? Kind of weird, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's just, just a little strange. And, and it seems like Indy has been throwing the ball a lot uh, as well with, with Philip Rivers. And Phil's still getting those fourth fourth quarter interceptions in every week. Love that guy. Um, the The <laughs> Bengals... They've uh, they've been really good against the run the last couple weeks. Not like obviously week two against Cleveland first Thursday night game of the year. You know, after week one, Cleveland Hunt just destroyed them. Chubb destroyed them. They gave up almost 50 fantasy points to running backs in week two. Um, But since then, at Philadelphia, they have 14 points to running backs. Home against Jacksonville, they gave up 12.7 points to running backs. And at Baltimore, they gave up 15.2 points to running backs. I, um, you know, and that's that's fine. Um, but if they if they keep that similar output, then that doesn't put Taylor as a top 10 back. Um, that's I have him down at 19 just because I do think the Bengals rush defense has greatly improved 
And so if and they're they're going to make Philip Rivers beat him. Would wouldn't you at this point? I mean, that's that's why they're stacking the boxes to to make Phil Phil beat him. And um, yeah, I just for whatever reason, I, I can see him falling into the end zone twice. Absolutely. I don't think the Bengals are, are that great, but it, it's just a, they're going to stack the box and make Philip beat them. That's what I would do. Hopefully that's what the Bengals do. And if, if so, then I think 19 is more of a, a fair ranking. Currently, Jonathan Taylor is running back 14. Um, so he basically falls somewhere right in the middle of, of where we have him ranked um, for uh, the weekly average. So. Just uh, just down on him for whatever reason. All righty. Our next running back is James Conner, currently going up against Cleveland this week. I have him down all the way, if you would say. It's down at running back 12. Alex has him all the way up at running back four this week. Alex, why are you so high on James Conner? At home against Cleveland. When James Conner plays and, and stays healthy... He's a top seven, top eight back almost every week. So if like week one, obviously he got hurt, but half PPR scoring after that, when he came back week two, 16 carries 109 and a touchdown. Week three, 18 carries 109 and a touchdown. Last week, 15 carries 44 yards and a touchdown. He's had 13.8 points or more every week that he's played a full game. He's clearly the bell cow back there. Um, this is a division matchup. They tend to run the ball more in division matchups for what that's, that's just my observation. That's, there's no, I don't have any facts to back that up, but again, inner division, lower scoring games, generally more running the ball, more physical. There's more hatred because they see each other more often. Obviously there's dislike between Cleveland and the Steelers from last year. Hopefully there's no helmet throwing or helmet bashing this year. So I just, it, James Conner has always played good against Cleveland. Uh, I have him ranked fourth this week. Um, he has a touchdown every week that he's played a full game. So if you can lock in that touchdown, then yeah, top 10 back. I have him at four. Okay. That's, I guess, mostly logical. Um, I guess what I would say is the most concerning aspect of it to me is going up against the Browns defense. They're a defense that you have a lot more success uh, beating uh, by going through the air than you do on the ground. Uh, Cleveland currently giving up the mm-hmm. second most points to receivers um, and only giving up the fourth fewest rushing yards allowed per game. Currently in the NFL, only Tampa, Pittsburgh, and Indy are giving up fewer fewer rushing yards per game. Um, The Browns have uh, scored more points through the first five weeks. This is a fun stat. The Browns have scored more points through the first five weeks this year than they did through the first nine last year. So they're also a better team than they were last year and seeing more success themselves. Um, I just think that Really, I think that Ben's going to have to go through the air to beat him. And we saw that Ben's really good at going through the air uh, last week. And we also saw that the Steelers aren't afraid to turn to receivers down in the red zone and at the goal line. Chase Claypool getting targets and touches and rushing attempts inside the five yard line. So I'm just I'm a little bit leery of them being able to go big on big against Cleveland, uh, who's currently giving up the fourth fewest rushing yards per game in the league. So I'm still not all the way down on him, especially with the buys and whatnot. I still have him as a top 12 play. I just think that this will not be one of his better weeks this season. So I am a little bit down on James Conner. Yeah, I've, I've also been waiting for... Connor to start catching the ball a little bit more. I mean, he has two plus catches in every every game, but I, I've, I'm kind of waiting for like that six catch for, you know, 35 to 70 yards with a touchdown. It, it just hasn't happened yet for whatever reason, but I feel like it's coming. He is a good receiving back. 
Um, and if uh, if the way to beat him through the air, he's still their best receiving back as well. So maybe he gets in through the air here, too. Yep. Uh, next up, running back Miles Gaskin go- currently going up against the New York Jets this week. I have him as my 13th overall running back. Alex has him at six. You got to like the uh, additional involvement that you're seeing out of him um, in that offense. The Jets are the fifth worst in the NFL against the run. Is it just the matchup against the J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 or is it anything more than that? Yeah, clearly, clearly just the matchup. The the most encouraging thing about last week was uh, Gaskin getting a one yard touchdown run and they didn't put Jordan Howard in for the vulture. Um, That touchdown came in the first quarter, which you have to be super encouraged about. 21 touches last week. Um, Not super efficient from a yards per carry, um, but it was still the San Francisco defense and they had a sizable lead and they were moving the ball all over them. So having, you know, under a four yard uh, average per carry against the 49ers is not, you know, damning or anything like that. Not not a big surprise. 21 touches against one of the worst defenses in the NFL. Sign me up. That's that's all it is. It's a it's strictly a matchup thing. And uh, for the first I mean, Gaskin's first touchdown was last week. He's been remarkably consistent, um, you know, basically since week one, which nobody even knew who this guy was before the season started. And he's clearly been their their best playmaker um, on the ground. Uh, I think you could say Parker and uh, Gesicki have probably been more explosive, but um, yeah, Gaskin's super consistent. I'm high on him this week, mostly because the Jets suck. Yeah, I think the his personal usage is in terms of snap counts and snap percentage has largely remained unchanged other than week three when he played 75%. Every other week is between 63 and 65%. So he's only in on about two thirds of snaps. Um, however, when he is in, he's getting a lot of usage. But what I would say is, Jordan Howard, for the first time in five weeks last week, saw 0% snap usage for the first time. He did not see the field last week, was in on zero snaps. Wow. And that is what is going to make Miles Gaskin turn the corner from a flex running back to a mid to low end RB2. If they can keep If they keep Jordan Howard off the field, they leave Miles in. He's getting that goal line work, all the work inside the 10 and red zone. That's where fantasy points are made. Um, So and we're seeing that now. I I don't think I'm particularly low on him, uh, just given the state of that offense, at least on the ground, just because I don't think he's ever going to touch 100 yards rushing. Um, He might get 100 total yards. Um, but I don't, I would be shocked if he hit a hundred yards more than he, like he twice. could this week against the jets. I was going to say, if he does it more than like twice on the season right. or maybe yeah, three and, times, I'd be shocked. But yep. And, and there's a floor here too, where he has at least three catches and at least 22 yards receiving in every game. Uh, so you're, you're getting a guaranteed floor with a super high end upside against one of the worst defenses in the NFL. Um, Miles Gaskin currently RB 23. You have to expect that to continue to go up um, the rest of the season, especially if Jordan Howard is, uh, is not going to play. I will be interested, you know, since we last filmed, you know, Lev Bell got cut and we haven't really talked about it. I think we will at the end here. I would not be surprised to see the Miami Dolphins cut Jordan Howard. Um, there's no point in taking up a roster spot for a third string running back that's not going to play special teams. That That's a lot of times what you see on teams is those ancillary backs. They have to do more than like if you're not going to be on the field on offense, then you have to play special teams. You either have to cover kicks or kickoffs or punts or whatever. And Jordan Howard isn't doing that. So what's the point of even having him on the team? Just cut him, take the cap hit. I believe they signed him. I don't know if it was a one-year deal or two-year deal, um, but just cut him. And so just keep your eye on that because he might be pick upable if he does get cut. So just something to monitor there. If he signs somewhere else in a meaningful role. 
All right, that does it for running backs that we are going to debate. Let's move on. We're going to do a tight end, and then we'll hit receivers. Our one tight end that we are going to debate this week is Evan Ingram playing against the Washington Redskins this week. I have Evan Ingram all the way down at my tight end 11, so barely a fringe tight end one, and Alex has him up as tight end five this week. Uh, I am shocked and can't believe it. Alex, why is Ingram a top five tight end against the Washington Redskins? Oh, I'm sorry. Mostly the Washington football team. Uh, Wallers. The Washington football team. Have to correct sorry. myself. Ingram should have had two touchdowns last week, one on a trick play, um, which was great, and the lineman wasn't set. He looked really explosive last week. I know he didn't have the ball that much. They had to turn around and give the ball to him on a on a reverse uh, to get him in the end zone, but he looked super explosive when he did have the ball. Uh, his targets so far this year, 7, 8, 5, 10, and 2. Um, last week was, I believe, his second highest scoring week, even though he only had two targets. Um, but again, he's stayed healthy and he's getting targets that you like to see at the tight end position. Um, Washington is giving up a good amount of points to tight ends. Week one, Philadelphia, they gave up almost 30 points to tight ends. Week two against Arizona, the, who is their tight end? I don't know if they have a tight end. They didn't do much. Um, week three, Cleveland, they scored a touchdown. Week four against Baltimore, Mr. Andrews had two tutties. The Rams had 13 points against uh, their tight ends, had 13 points against their defense. So they're giving, they're the 29th worst against the tight ends. So they're the third, third worst against tight ends. So yeah, give me some Mark Ingram. Okay. I would also say that they've probably faced some of the better tight ends in the league. If the, if they uh, were up against uh, Dallas Goddard, in week one when he absolutely lit the world on fire. But yes, um, I hear and you. Tight end, like from a tight end talent position, I do think Evan Ingram is one of the more talented tight ends from just a skill set position in the NFL. So yeah, they might've faced some of the better tight ends, but who's to say Evan Ingram isn't one of the more skilled tight ends when he's healthy and their offense is actually functioning properly. Yeah. That's it. There are two things that have to work together. The skill and the offense has to be clicking. The skill is there. The offense is not clicking. Um, through five weeks, if you want to talk target leaders at tight end, Evan Ingram, where would you think that he is in tight end targets? Probably top five after going seven, eight, five, ten 10 through four weeks. The only tight ends with more targets than Evan Ingram through five weeks are Darren Waller, Travis Kelsey, uh, Zach Ertz, and Hunter Henry. He has, Evan Ingram has 32. Waller leads the way with 47. Um, average depth of target, dot. These are, this, this number is amazing. So, Evan Ingram has an average depth of target of only four and a half yards. So they are dinking and yeah, dunking him. Kelsey has an A dot of 7.4. Waller, obviously, you know, 15 more passes uh, thrown his way than Ingram. Out of those top five, that group, uh, Waller has the second lowest A dot at just a shave under six. Uh, the other four are all in the seven and eight yard range. So Evan Ingram is running <laughs> or getting the ball thrown to him, you know, <laughs> just four yards, four yards downfield. Um, Take a step. All right. Turn around. All exactly. Right, like and then as far as this offense goes, Daniel Jones will not match Dak Prescott's output. Frozen in time. Through the first five weeks, if 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 Daniel Jones stays on pace, he will not match Dak's fantasy points until week 14 of the season. Oh, God. <laughs> so, if you want to talk about athletic ability, I give it to you. I absolutely give it to you on that one. If you want to talk about the state of that offense, 
I think that they have a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he finishes as a, you know, top 12 play in a favorable matchup. I have him as tight end 11. Um, Yeah, but I'm just, the targets are there. I just want the production to be there. Yeah, targets are there. And I would also say that, you know, again, they started home against Pittsburgh at Chicago, home against San Francisco. Apparently San Francisco's defense is going to get destroyed by Fitzpatrick. But uh, I just, uh, you know, they've gone up against some pretty good defenses, including the Rams week four. And I just like Evan Ingram to get on track this week. It's a it's a gut call. I, I think he finishes as a top five tight end. All right. Now talk to me about our next receiver, Mike Evans, cur- or going up against Green Bay this weekend. I have him as wide receiver 15 this week. You have Mike Evans all the way up. It was wide receiver eight. Why are you high on Mike Evans? He has a touchdown in every game. He's played five games. He has six touchdowns. He had two against Denver. Uh, that that wonderful two two catches, two yards, two touchdown week. Um, he, he only had one catch for two yards. It was a touchdown week one. But other than that, like every other week, he's been over 12, um, even against a tough matchup against the Bears. He still outputted 12.6. I believe Godwin's still questionable to play this week. Um, If he's not going to play, I I think that this is going to be a relatively high scoring affair. Green Bay's going to get up. They're going to have to throw to keep up. And so Mike Evans is going to have to show up as long as he gets on the field. um, I think he ends up being a top 10 play. He's currently wide receiver seven on the on the year. I have him ranked eight this week and you have him down at 15. Um, good old Mike Evans. I think that his success is dependent upon Chris Godwin playing. Uh, Godwin got in a preliminary yep. practice today. Um, a, a limited practice. I, I'm not. I don't know. If Godwin plays, I worry about Mike Evans. Uh, Let's read through these Mike Evans target numbers. Yes, he has a score in every game. He leads uh, all receivers in red zone touchdowns this season. Um, But his target numbers, four in week one. He had one catch for two yards and a score. Ten in week two against Carolina. He lit up for seven catches, 100 yards and a score. Week three. Four targets in week three, two catches for two touchdowns for one yard apiece. <laughs> like his scoring is absolutely being propped up by these touchdowns, let alone these multiple touchdown games. Yep. Um, his yards by game, two yards against New uh, New Orleans in week one, 100 yards against Carolina the next week, two yards for two touchdowns in Denver in week three. 120 yards against the Chargers in week four and five catches for 40 yards and another score against the Bears last week. It's just if he stops or when he stops scoring touchdowns, it's going to be a precipitous fall for Mike Evans. Um, it's, and, I, and I think it's not going to be pretty when Godwin comes back and is healthy. So if he does, I am See, very I, worried about Evans. I disagree with you, and this is why. He's going to get his yards. Just because he hasn't yet doesn't mean he's not going to. I I mentioned this in the preseason, and it still holds true. I mean, going into the year, Mike Evans, yards per game all time. He was sixth on the all-time list of yards per game at 80, uh, just a shade over 80 yards a game. He's going to get his yards at some point. So, you know, if the touchdown production slows down, I think that's still going to be fine because at some point he's going to replace him with the yards. Um, he, he's an all-time talent. He's had over a thousand yards receiving every year that he's been in the NFL. Um, so why would he, uh, you know, why would he not continue to duplicate that? That's that's ultimately my question, right? In week one, he had one. He had four targets, one catch for two yards and a score. In week three, he had four targets. Two catches, two yards, and two scores. So two one one yard no, touchdowns. I get that. And guess who else was playing in weeks one and week three? Chris Godwin. 
all of the other three weeks that he's right. gone off for more, Chris Godwin hasn't been playing. So I think that there's a very real correlation between if Godwin is on the field and Mike Evans' lack of the or lack of ability to produce. So whether or not that stays true for the whole season or is as dramatic as two yards and one score or two yards and two scores, I think is something else entirely different. Um, I'm just worried about Tom Brady locking on to Godwin when he's there. We talk, uh, we did talk in the preseason too. And I said, you know, in trying to pick between the two, my favorite was Godwin because he runs the type of routes that Brady likes to throw the over the middle slant, you know, slot kind of routes that Brady loves. So yep. we'll see if it happens. If Godwin comes back, I would be nervous if he doesn't. I absolutely fire up Mike Evans. You're firing him up anyways, because you drafted him in the end of the second beginning of the third rounds in most 12 team leagues. Um, The other thing I would say that actually makes me a little bit nervous is I worry about the Packers ability to run the ball uh, this week against Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay only giving up 2.7 yards per attempt on the season which is mm-hmm. by far the lowest in the league by more than half a yard per rushing attempt. So uh, I, I'm worried about Green Bay's ability to run the ball in this one. I think they're going to pass it a ton. Rodgers, I think, is going to have a, a very nice game. But yeah. Yep. All righty. Let's move on, shall we? We got a couple more receivers left to get through. Next, we have Russell Gage at Minnesota. I have him as a low end flex play uh, wide receiver 33. Alex has him uh, all the way up at wide receiver 44 this week. He is nursing a shoulder injury. Um, I think I'll talk about why I have him up as a flex play given his really not, not great output uh, the last few weeks. Let's see here. Uh, Russell Gage fantasy output over the last three weeks. Uh, three targets, two catches, 26 yards, three and a half fantasy points. Three targets, two catches, 22 yards, three fantasy points. Five targets last week against Carolina, only managed two catches for 16 yards, two and a half fantasy points. However, weeks one and two, when they're fully stocked, he was getting week one, 12 targets against Seattle, 115 yards on nine catches. Week two, nine targets against Dallas, six catches, 50 yards and a score. So that's when they're fully healthy. You go against three other teams. He's injured. Hopefully he gets a little bit more healthy. They're going up against Minnesota, who's giving up currently the sixth most points to receivers. I think he's a fine flex play dart throw. Um, Yeah, I'm not. I'm not offended if you start Russell Gage this week. Um, however, what I would say is if if he doesn't produce in this, then to me he's dead and he's droppable. Yeah, he's he's basically droppable for me. That's why I have him ranked so low. I would also point out that the two weeks that he did anything, one was against Seattle, who's on pace to give up the most yards in NFL history by 500 yards. <laughs> and the other defense was at Dallas, who also has a really terrible pass defense. And so since then, Chicago, Green Bay, Carolina, he's done nothing. Well, so he's got Minnesota. If anything, he is a str- he is a strictly a a matchup where you got to hope that they're facing a bad defense. Yes, Minnesota does not have a great pass defense. Um you know, giving up the, what do you say, fifth most uh, points to to wide sixth. receivers, but a lot of that is six. Okay, so a lot of that's bo- uh, because Green Bay lit them up for four touchdowns week one, um, and then last week they faced Russ and Ryan Tana thrills in there. So they, uh, you know, they've they faced some good quarterbacks, um, and we, we don't know what that offense is going to look like. Um, now that they fire their GM and co- and head coach, maybe Todd Gurley continues to be a top 10 back. Who knows? We don't know. Um, I just uh, I just don't think Russell Gage is really all that playable unless you're really desperate. I'm not going to fight you. 
Uh, he's a low end flex play. And I think if he doesn't produce in a plus matchup, then he's absolutely droppable. Um, we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we even mentioned this to, to start the pod. We probably should have. Um, you know, we're only talking about players that we really like. These are the mo- the players that we disagree the most on. Um, per, you know, if you go check out our rankings at thefantasyfootballstackos.com, you will see that the rest of our rankings are pretty tight and close together. Um, we're just trying to highlight people that we disagree on. For all other ranking questions, like go check that out. We have flex rankings posted uh, for you to for you to peruse, um, and you can see how right we are. Peruse me. Oh, man. All right. Let's get into our last receiver here to talk about this week. Uh, Man, Alex got hammered on him in our YouTube videos, which we will get into later as well. Uh, Let's talk about some Chase Claypool, the hot, hot waiver wire ad of the week. Chase Claypool. I have him as a low end flex play this week. Uh, Not sure if Deontay returns. Alex has him all the way down as wide receiver 46, which is honestly just offensive after he led the league in scoring last week with four touchdowns, three through the air, one on the ground. Uh, Everybody in the world agrees with your boy here, Jason, on how uh, Alex is probably the worst valuer of uh, waiver wire ads uh, rookie receivers, maybe in history, probably known to man, and maybe that's why he's owned. How five much did you fantasy. spend on Naheem Hines week I'm, one? How, how much? I'm, how much did you bid on Naheem Hines? I'm talking about rookie receivers, not irrelevant. No, hold on. Bad. No, let's waiver let's back ads. Up. How how much? How much An did you spend on Naheem amount. Hines? I think it was probably 30% to 40% of my fab on Naheem Hines in week one because I was duped into believing that he was Austin Eckler light and turns out he is not, uh, he's not the light version. He's like the Miller genuine draft version. He's like the keystone version of Austin Eckler. So He's been flushed. He's been dropped from my team. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, however, yeah, it happens. We all get duped every once in a while. So anyways, let's what goes get... up must come down. It's going to come down. It's going to settle in not Chase. nearly as low. Clay, Cleveland's giving up the second most points to wide receivers at more than 47 a week. I'm assuming that Deontay Johnson is back in my ranking just for the record. I like him more. I like Juju Smith Schuster more. Um, the only way that he ends up higher than where I have him ranked is if he scores a touchdown. He's he's probably not going to. He had coming into last week, he had six total catches, and we're all of a sudden he's the second coming of Randy Moss. Like, just stop. Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin said that Deontay Johnson would be limited at practice to start the week and that his uh, participation would determine whether or not he's available on Sunday. Um, Even though the injury doesn't sound too serious, neither him nor Juju practiced on Wednesday. So interesting. Uh, we'll see if he starts, might be limited to start the week and then, you know, gear up in time to, to get the game in Sunday against the Browns. But he's just, he's dealing with a lot of minor injuries and he has been all the way back since the summer. Um, I guess my thing is, I think either Deontay or Chase Claypool will have Ben's attention or Ben's priority of targets in the pecking order over Juju. And I really don't think that we're going to see James Washington when all three are finally healthy and available. I really think that James is going to disappear. Claypool easily looked like the best receiver, best player on that field last week. I don't think they're going to just, no, sorry, back to the bench with you. Sorry. Like, I don't think it's going to happen. So, We spend so much time talking about players that probably aren't going to matter the rest of the season. And I don't think Chase Claypool is going to matter all that much the rest of the season. 
Sorry. So then, so then where do you think he finishes rest of season? Make it a board bet. How irrelevant do you think Chase Claypool is? He won't finish. I, I mean, he has that massive week, right? There's, I don't think he finishes in the top 25. I'd be surprised if he finished in the top 30. Okay. The rest of season, take out that week. Where do you think he finishes from week six on as wide receiver? What? 30 or under. 30? 30. That's, that's a wide receiver too yeah. in 12 team, 14 team leagues. 30? Would you go 40? That's, that's Can where I get I, a four? That's where I have Justin Jefferson at. No. <sighs> I mean, uh, honestly, maybe if I'm feeling frisky, I, again, he, he, he was, you say the all third, that, but then the you go wide routes, receiver 30. on his team. Fine. 35. Okay. That's still a flex play, but okay. All right. Wide receiver 35 rest of season. Fine. I'll give you 40. Put it on, hey, you, I'll give you 40. I'm not, That's fine. you, you plant your you flag and you put it on the board. I just think it's going to happen, okay. but. Okay. Woof. All right. Wide receiver 40 week six on. I'm there. <laughs> He'll be dropped by like week 10. <laughs> <laughs> At least you know it though. Oh my goodness. Oh man. All right. Well, that brings us to newsy stuff. Newsy stuff. That's right. I love that drop so freaking much. All right. Well, let's uh let's not move off. <laughs> Let's not move off the Chase Claypool shenanza bonanza just yet. Uh, Alex has been getting an extreme amount of hate from our followers, listeners, anybody who stumbles upon our videos. And so <clears throat> I would like to read a couple of these comments out loud uh, if I could. The first one. Please. The first one says the dude on the right, Alex, because he's on the right on YouTube. The dude on the right just pointed out that he got more production with less reps and tried to paint it in a negative way. Think about that. Alex, what do you have to say to we the people? This is not one person's comment. This is we the people talking about you and your fantasy analysis. We should all be very high on Jordan Howard for having four carries for four yards and four touchdowns the first week because of the production being there. That's a stupid comment, in my opinion. <laughs> We're insulting our listeners. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the facts are there. If, he, if he's on the field less, he's going to score less. That's how this works. Just like the fact, like he's not going to be A.J. Brown who has all of these limited targets last year, you know, being what wide receiver 15 and he had like the 25th most targets or something like that. The reason why we talk about things like that is opportunities breed success in fantasy football generally. And if he ain't on the field, he can't score. So it makes sense. Think about that. Next comment, Bryant Murray. What the hell is this guy on? Have you seen Claypool play? He's clearly their best receiver and he will get more snaps as the year goes on. What you do you really got, think Alex? he's better than Juju Smith Schuster? He's not better than Juju Smith Schuster. He's just not. Juju Smith Schuster had 1,400 yards a couple years ago. 1,400 in a season. He's proven that he's good. He was a top five fantasy wide receiver. You think he's better than Juju Smith Schuster? That's wrong. You're wrong. Yeah, well, this is from Shockey. Yeah, well, in my 14 team league, week at wide receivers, I'm dropping a pretty penny for Claypool. 14 team, it's a little different. If you're thin at wide receiver, I understand why you need to roll the dice. And I think you're going to be greatly disappointed, just like my wife is most of the time. <laughs> uh, from R. Smith. 
with a Wu-Tang Clan symbol. The hate is strong with this one. Hashtag Chase Play Cool. Okay. Ooh, don't hate the player, hate the game. Hate the hate the now, mid-level you can, you can hate- Hate you can the hate mid-level me all you fantasy want. Fantasy analysis. <laughs> you can hate me, but I'm right. <sighs> and then lastly, from Khalid Musid, keep the videos coming. We sure will, Khalid. I uh, I don't think we're gonna be going anywhere anytime soon. Um, oh, actually, three minutes ago we had another one. Uh, oh. this is great. DNA Media Group commented on Bryant Murray's post and said, "Agreed." Furthermore, let's point out Week One when the game was on the line, they put the ball in Claypool's hands to finish the game out. Let's also add in the fact that there was no preseason, and every week Claypool production has gone up. Based on the metrics, he's closer to Calvin Johnson. He has speed, good hands, and has been amazing with limited targets. What's up, Calvin Johnson Claypool? How you doing? What do you have to say, Alex? He, he had one catch for 24 yards in week three, and now all of a sudden we think he's going to be a top 20 wide receiver all year. I mean, seriously, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the hate. I love the hate. Let the hate flow through you, listeners. <laughs> See, uh, pe- people like you can listen to us and we appreciate it. But just because I say something that you don't want to hear doesn't mean I'm wrong. Oh, man. Don't ever say that to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> She's All used right. to it by now. Let's get off of Claypool, please. And your wife. <clears throat> <laughs> oh man in more newsy stuff uh levy on bell obviously has been cut everybody knows it by now um he made 28 million dollars in just 18 games with the jets uh evidently they it's had several it. they had several interested trade partners however in the end nobody wanted to cough up for that contract so the jets had to bite the bullet and cut him um unbelievable so we have quite a little horse race developing for the services of Le'Veon bell with the chiefs as the very early favorites he actually already uh follows patrick mahomes on twitter sent him a follow uh on wednesday night so uh, evidently they're just kind of working out the details. There's four more teams that are horse jockeying to get his services and to get him under contract. But I just, I'm not sure how, I, I don't know. Do you think he, do you think yeah, he signs so, with the chiefs? So it, it, it looks like the five teams, if he doesn't sign with the chiefs, it's going to be between the bears, Raiders, Patriots, and dolphins. Um, Obviously, if he, if he signs with the Chiefs, uh, Clyde Edwards' whole air value uh, drops uh, significantly. Uh, before we came on the pod, uh, Jason actually traded Clyde uh, for Tyreek Hill um, just on the off chance that Lev Bell does sign with the Chiefs. Um, so if you're a Clyde owner um, and he signs with the Chiefs, you that that would just suck. That's a first round pick, maybe early second round pick that all of a sudden doesn't really have a whole lot of value potentially. Um, Bears, you're worried about him taking away from Monty or it'd be interesting to see how much they do uh, continue to use Cordero Patterson in the backfield. Their Raiders, obviously that would hurt Josh Jacobs value uh, significantly. Patriots, I mean, just add them to the smorgasbord of uh of running backs there and then dolphins gaskins um would would be impacted the most and i think you would definitely see jordan howard get cut uh if they did sign love bell so um those are kind of the five teams um the report is that he's going to sign either tonight after we're on recording or early tomorrow when this is dropping um so I, I think if you're a bell owner you're actually happy that he got cut um for the jets 
I guess you're just going to roll roll out the carpet with with Frankie Gore, uh, who I did say would be fantasy relevant before the season started. And here we are starting running back week six, the ageless wonder Frank Gore. So, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, actually. um, Chiefs player Chris Jones actually posted a video on social media with Le'Veon Bell in it, screaming, what if? Hashtag what if at the Chiefs let's go at Le'Veon Bell and it's him and Le'Veon Bell hanging out screaming about Le'Veon Bell signing with the Chiefs. So we'll see if they're able to come to a deal. It would absolutely destroy, I think, Clyde Edwards Hilaire's fantasy value for the season. Uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire is 0 for 7 at the goal line so far this season. I mean, that's the one thing that's Six really missing. Six of those missing. series were week one, though. That's the one thing that's really missing from his game. Uh, so far on the season, he's produced, you know, he's he's getting 100 total yards in every game. He just hasn't been able to push the ball over the goal line and get into the end zone. I think Le'Veon's going to struggle just the same, quite honestly. I just think that that offensive line isn't exactly where it needs to be in terms of moving D lines off of goal line, off of the goal line and whatnot. When everybody's selling out, you got a stacked box. Um, Lev Bell. I think he's a favorite for the chiefs. If I had Clyde Edwards, Elaire, I would be doing everything I can to try and probably trade him for something of equal value. Like Alex said, I actually moved him for Tyreek, which is not equal value. If Edwards Alaire is the only running back there this season, but if Lev Bell is there and Lev Bell is getting the red zone goal line work, I think it's a steal of a deal. So good luck yep. to all of our Clyde Edwards Alaire managers out there. And Sam Darnold has to just be like crying in a corner as he sees Le'Veon Bell and Jamal Adams escape to freedom. <laughs> From from Hello, Adam Gaseland, my old friend. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, man. Um, and then lastly, we have something that honestly kind of sucks to talk about. Uh, we have a player doing something stupid, reckless, irresponsible. Uh, Melvin Gordon got a DUI last night, or, or well, not last night. By the time this airs, it'll be two nights ago. Uh, got a DUI Tuesday night. He came into practice on Wednesday. Uh, evidently, he immediately called the Broncos ownership, told him what happened, owned up to it, apologized. Vic Fangio came out on Wednesday and said he's undecided whether or not Melvin Gordon will be forced to sit out against the Patriots in week six as punishment. Uh, he said, quote, he's one of us. We're going to love him, but there will be some consequences to what happened last night. So. What a time for Philip Lindsay to come back into the fold. Um, those Denver beat mm-hmm. reporters can't really talk about what the depth chart would be at, at practice and who's getting reps over who anymore. But he was sent home from practice. He did not practice today. So you have to imagine it was all Philip Lindsay all the time at practice. We'll see how the week unfolds. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Gordon is suspended at least one game. I don't know what the legal do. I'm um, it's obviously conduct that that's not the best, you know, for the league. So yikes. What do you have to say other than that? Right. Yikes. Drinking and driving is bad. Yeah. Let's not do that. That's it. On that very sobering note, thank you for sticking with us and may Le'Veon <laughs> Bell ruin all of our seasons. And and just continue this lovely 2020 fantasy football season that that was or is. <laughs> Sobering note. Wow. What a transition. Uh, all right. I'm going to the social media page. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for listening. Please follow us on social media. We are at the FF Sackos everywhere. Hit that like button, hit subscribe, ring the bell if you're watching on YouTube. Thank you guys for everything. And we will catch you on Tuesday for waiver advice. Have a good night. Good luck in week six and happy tax day. It's finally tax day, October 15th. Yes. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Football Sackos podcast. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter 
at the FF Sackos. 